and welcome everyone to the March 1st work session of the Board of County Commissioners. We are here to talk about, uh, get a work session and some information about private roads in the county and the history of them and what some of the difficulties are uh, leading up to that. So Sarah, did you want to introduce our guests? And I should also say that I'm Karen Willey, County Commissioner. I am sitting in for Commissioner Patrick Kelly, who is not able to attend the work session today. Um, and Commissioner Shannon Reed is actually on Zoom with us. So she will also be participating. So, and thank you everyone for being here. You have to wait a second too when you turn them on. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Willie. Just a reminder for our audience and for anyone who's listening online that these work sessions are for informational purposes only and no action is taken during these meetings. We also do not take public comment at, this, at these meetings, but uh, you are certainly welcome to stick around for our 5.30 meeting in which we do take public comment. So we can also take public comment at that meeting. And we're gonna make sure we speak really close into these microphones so that you all can hear us um, well. So with that, I'm gonna introduce and turn this over to Tanya Voigt, our Director of Zoning and Codes to walk us through uh, Douglas County's history on private roads. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, I'm going to share screen here just in a moment. Okay, I'm Tanya Voigt. I'm the Zoning and Codes Director for Douglas County. Um, we, Douglas County has a long history of private roads. We have um, approximately 169 private roads in Douglas County today. Um, and we've um, been tasked with quite a few challenges uh, about private roads. We're gonna go through those challenges today and then um, hopefully propose a few solutions to try to clean up and fix some of those issues. So the first question is, what is a private road? And private roads provide access to several hundred residential properties in Douglas County. We actually did a count and it's um, about 484 residences that private roads service um, in Douglas County. Subdivision regulations allowed the creation of private roads from 1998 um, all the way up to 1998, and then again with the subdivision regulations from 2006 up to 2020. They were called different things, and we'll go into that. Um, but there's there's been there was a long time frame where private roads were allowed in the county. Landowners are responsible for the maintenance of private roads, which means that the county townships or counties do not actually maintain those roads. So they don't push snow off of them. They don't add rock to them. It is um, solely the responsibility of those landowners using that private road to do the maintenance of that private road as well. Private roads are located in something that's called an easement. They're access easements. They cross through private property to allow access for others to use them. Access easements are recorded and filed with the Register of Deeds Office. So that's how our office finds information about these roads. Um, we have the ability to use GIS, which is really amazing, but to actually find the technical legal document that's filed with the Register of Deeds. Access includes the homeowners getting um, access to their residences, guests going to and from those um, specific homes, delivery trucks, fire department, and medical responders. Some private roads have been assigned road numbers to guide those emergency responders and some have not. Existing private roads continue to generate questions, complaints, and requests for modifications. A lot of those requests are for additional residences on those private roads. So how do we break this down in a way that's kind of easy to digest? Um, and, and this is the simplest way I could think to do it. Old access easements, they were created prior to the 1972 original development of the subdivision regulations. Those old access easements, we have no inventory of. We don't know how many of them there are. Um, in Douglas County, the county land is a lot different than city land. City land is platted. And so you kind of know what you're getting into when you purchase a property because you can look at the plat documents, you can look at right away information, um, you can look usually at building setbacks, you can look at um, future roads, all those type of things on city lots. But out in the county, when someone has just a vacant piece of property, we actually have to do quite a bit of research to determine when that property was created in the shape it is today and if it met certain rules at the time the shape was created. 
Um, so those old access easements, we find that information with the register of deeds. We have a property owner, they'll reach out to us. They'll say, I wanna build a house on a landlocked piece of property. And um, it initially, you know, our, our urge is to say no, um, but instead we um, reach out, uh, do the research with the register of deeds, and we see if an easement had been filed prior to 1972. If it is an easement prior to, prior to 1972, it's um, vested or grandfathered, and so those are allowed to get building permits today. Private, private. Can, I, can yes. I jump in with just a quick question? Uh, you mentioned landlocked properties, and that is not a term that just everybody would be familiar with. Could you talk about that and why that's a problem? Yeah, so landlocked properties are properties that have no public road access. Um, so you would need to create you would need to cross other parcels um, that that probably do have road access to get back to that property. Um, traditionally, today, um, our current road standards, anytime someone wants to build a house, you have to have a specific amount of road frontage um, associated with that parcel, and it, it's determined on what the road classification is. So if it's on a really heavy traffic paved road that's more like a highway, we actually require a quarter mile of road access just to get a building permit. Um, and then if you get out to the local township roads, a um, lot less uh, traffic impacts, they're typically rock roads, we require 250 feet of road frontage for a buildable parcel. And uh, there's a variation all the way from 250 to a quarter mile depending on the road classification system. So then private roads were approved by the county commissioners from 1972 to 1998, which meant that if a, a developer or landowner that wanted you know, their kids to be able to access property that didn't have road frontage to build a house, they would go to the board of county commissioners and they would ask the county commissioners for a specific number of residences to take access from that private road. And then um, they were actually, in 1998, the Douglas County said, we don't want any more private roads. These are creating quite a few issues. We are going to prohibit any future private roads. Um, but what ended up happening is we ended up calling private road a different term um, in 2006 with the 2006 subdivision regulations so people could essentially create subdivisions. And those subdivisions then allowed private roads and the private roads um, will go into the issues with those cross access easements. So the old access easements, like I said, we don't know how many there are. We just do the research when they come to us. Those are the ones that need to predate 1972 and they are considered legal for us and we do allow building permits with those. Here's um, just a picture of one. It's kind of hard to see, but back in the trees, there's a house. Um, they, they just built this year, they pulled a building permit um, actually in 2022, and they just got occupancy, and that is off of an old access easement that predated 1972. Here's a little bit more shocking version of that. So I think it's just important to point out there's all different variations of these old cross access easements. The little, you know, one house on our little country lane is, is one thing. And then we have um, essentially subdivisions that were created um, prior to 1972 where multiple homes uh, take access from those old access easements. How many is the total on like that particular piece right up there that you're the red that we're looking at? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, 10 houses. Okay. At this commissioner, I have a follow-up question. <clears throat> so I know we don't know all of those um, old access easements, but we obviously know some about, I mean, I guess I'm curious how frequent or about how many of, of these types that we know about where there's, I mean, 10 is significant and that's a, it goes over a lot of different properties. Do we know about how many of those we have I, versus just the three houses? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. We do not. Um, it would actually, we've had this conversation a lot through, you know, the change in the zoning regulations, and it seems to come up every time we start talking about roads and building permits and those type of things. Um, the research really would require every single parcel in Douglas County to be researched and then flagged. Um, as as having a cross access easement. And that's why we don't do that, um, just because it just would take, you know, we have say 50,000 parcels or whatever it might be. Um, it would just take an awful lot of work. 
So I have a follow-up question also. So most of these roads you're finding, most of these private roads, you're finding out about when somebody something goes wrong and somebody has a problem with how the road is being maintained or whether that is fair between neighbors or they want the county to take over. Would that be correct? Um, I'd say that's probably about half of the time. Um, most of the um, times when we're finding about the, finding out about these old access easements. So they're the ones that we have no inventory of. They predate 1972. It's typically someone wanting to get back to a parcel and they need to cross other people's property to get to it and they want a building permit. Um, we don't, the old access easements really complaint wise, I mean, we people have blocked them, people have built gates, people have barricaded them, neighbors have fought, um, those type of things. Um, but for the most part, it's 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 pretty minuscule and it's not regular. I would say most of the time when we are doing research, especially with these old cross access easements, are only when someone wants to get a building permit back, um, you know, crossing several people's property to get to a vacant parcel of land. So the private roads that were allowed from 1972 to 1998, um, that was a process that was defined in the subdivision regulations. The county commissioners were allowed to um, approve up to three residences per road. Um, I think it's important to note, and you'll see some where we actually, you know, we pull those Board of County Commission minutes when someone asks for a building permit. Um, some of the time, only uh, the request was for one house or two houses. It wasn't always for three. And then we have some situations where um, later they they had already maxed out on their three and they ended up going to the Board of Zoning Appeals to ask for, um, say, up to seven or eight um, homes on, on those private roads. So there's, there's a huge variation of the number of building permits someone can get on a private road. Uh, the road, there were road construction standards. We found some documentation of at that time, they were really struggling with how wide does the right of way need to be? How much um, does the road need to be built up? Does it need to have a crown? Does it need to have ditching? What are the construction standards? And um, does it need to be, you know, inspected by the county? Um, so there was a lot of talk about developing those standards, but to, um, at least to my knowledge, I don't believe that anything was ever formally adopted. And most certainly the county did not inspect um, the construction of those private roads. Another thing that is kind of interesting about the subregs and the creation of the private roads, at the same time that people were requesting you know, these building permits on private roads, people were platting. You were allowed to plat out in the county and create a subdivision through a platting process. The key was a platting process would is, is a lot more stringent. So it, it probably would have required paved roads or at least really specific construction standards and probably inspections. Um, and so um, when while platting was happening, I think this became kind of a, a little bit lower impact. So say someone, um, a lot of the platted subdivisions are more than three houses. So I think they were trying to kind of say, you know, three and under is lower impact and doesn't need to meet all the platting standards. So this is a way we're just going to kind of administratively approve it through the commission. Because a platted subdivision would not have a private road. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Those are publicly maintained roads, um, either by the township or the county. Uh, there also was a five acre exemption that um, led to the increase in the private road request. So all the way from 1972 to 2006, you could create five acre lots in Douglas County. Um, those five acre lots, uh, I think would, you know, uh, someone would divide off for their kids or neighbors or family members. And um, in order to do that, when they were, you know, creating those five acre lots, they'd go to the commission, and they'd say, well, we don't actually have road frontage for all five of those. So we'd like our kids to build, you know, we'll build a private road and our kids would like to take access from that. Um, and so the five acre exemption was a way um, and when you look at a map of the county and you pull up all the five acre exemptions, they look a lot like subdivisions um, because they're, you know, sporadic five acre pieces that are all sharing one road. So they look just like a subdivision for the most part. Uh, in 1998, there was a resolution um, that amended the subdivision regulations and said we would we don't want any more private roads and we want to prohibit them. Um, what it did during that time is uh, they realized the zoning codes office realized that they had issued building permits um, after that 1998 date, um, and there and so people were actually getting more building permits than really what they were. Now they're prohibited, so they really shouldn't have gotten building permits. 
Um, I think it's kind of important to note why that might have happened is, you know, back then in 1998, we didn't have GIS. You, you didn't just pull up a map of something and you were able to see um, what type of road it is, what the classification of the road is. We have property owners all the time who actually buy property on a private road and don't even realize that they're buying a property on a private road. They think it's a fully maintained road. So I do think it could be tricky um, for um, someone back then without all the tools we have today to really even, I mean, we were looking at our office would have looked at a site plan, which would have been probably a hand drawing showing a little lane and then the, the house. Um, and and the size of the lot probably. So I, I just, I think it was probably pretty easy to miss back then. So, and I've heard of people having this trouble, the property changes hands and the person that uh, buys that property is not told until sometime much later, they find out that they're responsible for a portion of that road of snow removal, adding gravel, keeping it from eroding, all of those things. So this isn't something that is always flagged in like a title search or with a um, a realtor. So how are people supposed to find out if they lived on a private road, if not through a title search? I think the only way is to contact the zoning and codes office or public works, most likely maybe the township. I mean, the township would be able to give pretty accurate information, but it actually requires kind of that local research because the title companies really don't, don't pick up on that. So this is kind of an op opportunity for buyer beware. This would be um, you're, there's no way to know unless you do your own homework on a property that you're buying. Okay. Thank you. Um, another thing that we're working on what that we're pretty excited about is a GIS tool. Um, so right now you can go into GIS. We can see how a road is maintained. We can see, you know, a lot of internal, um, um, you, you have to open a whole bunch of layers to get exactly what you want. Um, but we would like to create um, just a public tool, a layer in GIS where homeowners would be able to at least see if it's a, uh, you know, it, they can see right now if it's a township road or if, um, if it's county maintained, but we would be able to actually like flag it in bright letters, like a minimum maintenance road right now, it pops up as a really bright purple color. So we know not to issue building permits on minimum maintenance roads. And so uh, we would do something similar just so that when people are just tooling around in GIS that they'd be able to see where the private roads are um, and, and be able to kind of educate themselves as well. And would I be right to say that private roads, if they do have a road designation, have a brown sign and not a green sign, is that right? Uh, I'm Chad Voigt, Director of Public Works, and what we tried to do there was use brown signs to indicate private roads. That's uh, the approach we want to use. There are a lot of blue signs still out there, and so, um, you know, going to the effort to specifically replace them all wasn't something that we've tackled, uh, but those signs will wear out, and that's the intent eventually is to all be brown signs for private roads. And are some of these private roads not marked at all? Do they, if they're not marked at all, do they have a road designation? So I'm thinking of like for emergency response, does it, the address for that house is on a road that doesn't have the road number marked? How is that supposed to be found? Right. Yeah. A lot of them do not have road numbers marked in the field. And uh, if, if the GIS indicates that their address is off of that private road number, then we definitely have a sign. Um, and I think what you'll find is a lot of private roads weren't assigned a different number. So they have an address that's off of the main route, but it's it's an odd sort of number that's different on their house number, not the road number. Very confusing. And that's that's one of the downsides of the private road system. Is this an okay time to put a shout out for anybody listening who lives on a private road to uh, take the opportunity to call your fire department and get um, an address marker, those are they're bright blue with your address number on it or your whole address so that emergency responders can find your home. Um, that is on the responsibility of the homeowner, but they are super helpful and they uh, really increase the response times of being able to find your house the first time without going past it and doubling back. So that was just a side note. Go ahead. So 
um, from the 1972 to 1998 timeframe, we have documented um, inventory. So we have documented whether the roads were approved by the Board of County Commissioners, how many homes they were approved for. Um, we also have a note if they were just fell into the retroactive approval, like, oops, we issued building permits for these homes. Um, they weren't specifically approved by the Board of County Commissioners, but they fell in this blanket resolution that retroactively approved the existing homes that were there. Um, that inventory is good. We use it all the time. Um, the office has used it for years and years, um, but we dug a little deeper into it, um, mostly because we have a lot of um, landowner requests about private roads, and we wanted to be able to do um, some additional research. So we'll get into that here in a minute. So here's an example of a private road that was approved by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, so we can go back to those original minutes. We can find out how what the easement um, was for, how wide, um, typically how many houses, I think this one says one, when you go through oh, four tracts of land, um, and they are five acre exemptions. So these were a part of the five acre exemptions that then came through, asked for um, a private road, and then were able to access four homes from it. Uh, here's just a photo of that same location. This one is um, asphalt, if I have that right. Um, some are rock. Um, they, they really come in all different variations, um, the private roads do. Oh, another thing um, to note on the private roads, you see private drive there, the private drive sign. A lot of um, the private road landowners do request through the public works department um, because the roads don't connect to another road. So there's no connectivity or, or it's not a thoroughfare. There's usually a dead end. Sometimes there's a bulb, sometimes there's not for emergencies. Um, so a lot of um, landowners do request those private drive signs. So cluster developments, um, this is the newest chunk of the creation of private roads in Douglas County. Um, it happened with uh, the subdivision regulations in 2006. Cluster developments were only allowed in the urban growth area. So in the urban growth area, the 2006 regulations allowed people to create subdivisions in the UGA and they could create three acre lots. So that's why you'll see um, things outside of the five acre exemptions. And you see a lot of three acre lots that have one road going to them. Those were created after 2006 um, through that cluster development process. The rural residents that are served by that, there's, we call it the same term, it's called a cross access easement. The intention of those was, um, so the planning office created what's called an, the urban growth area. The urban growth area is was identified as area that would eventually annex into the city limits of Lawrence. Um, some of that area goes pretty far from town, you know, up to five miles south of town. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of that has become part of future discussions of really what will may annex and what may not and how long it's going to take for that to annex, but that's a different discussion. Um, the intent of the cross access easements were so that, um, that those cross access easements will eventually be a city street. So they're, they're, the right of way that was required to be dedicated for that um, would match the right of way that's needed for that to become a city street when that subdivision um, annexes into the city limits. It did require a build out plan, which is like a ghost plat. Those build out plans um, would show all the future um, roads, even the internal roads. So it would identify a road if it would be like, if it's gonna be in the city, is it gonna be an arterial road? Is it gonna be an alley? Is it gonna be, um, you know, what just a neighborhood road with smaller amounts of traffic? Uh, it identified utility easements and where the utility easements were to go. And it would identify also the build out plan. So where a property owner on that three acres could actually put structures, a house and accessory buildings. Um, that became uh, later a part of a discussion just about cluster developments um, and subdivisions in Douglas County. Uh, those build out plans uh, were not something that it, were easily accessible. And when we went through those cross access easements later on, we, did, we realized that um, when the building permits were being issued, that a lot of times, um, you know, accessory buildings, pools, all kinds of things were actually being built in those future areas. So what, what really probably needed to happen was you may have a three acre lot, but because of the future city build out plan, you only get you know, a quarter of an acre of a buildable area and that's your only building envelope. Um, but that didn't 
um, that it, it never really uh, applied and, and worked out for it to actually show future density. So the access roads were um, had a requirement that they were supposed to be built to county rock road standards, um, but they were never inspected by county staff. So um, there's a lot of variability. We do receive complaints regularly about the standards of the roads and potholes and ditching and drainage and those type of things. And they, um, the developers were did require um, for them to be built to county rock road standards, but they just weren't inspected. So the roads in these cross access easements that were created by cluster developments, they typically are maintained by the landowners. Sometimes there's a homeowners association that does the managing of the road and calling in rock and that type of stuff, or deciding that they wanna pave it or um, you know, all those decisions can be made also by a homeowners association. So I can recognize like a small um, private road could be maintained by an, a, a resident that also had a road grader or a, a skid steer or something that could move the rock, but most of these probably don't or don't have that time or that talent. Do they hire that done? Are there private companies then that are hired to do that work? I'm just curious about how that actually gets accomplished. That's a hard button to find. Um, yeah, so most of these are going to be contracted work. They they have a company come in with, you know, loads of rock and a skid steer if needed and, and shape it and grade it. And depending on how it was orig originally constructed, you know, that can be pretty frequent, almost annually in some cases. Not cheap, I'm imagining. Not cheap, no. So uh, a load of rock, you know, these days is going to run you 600 bucks. Uh, if they just drop it and that's the fuel and everything to get it there. So, um, and that'll get you 300 feet of, of the road covered once a year. So ballpark, this is a couple of thousand dollars a year that people are taking on and possibly buying a house on a private road with a need for a couple thousand dollars of investment annually or several every other year. And they don't know it. That's right. It's it's an investment for all of the owners. If they can get together and agree, that's the ideal situation. Some of them haven't been able to do that. And one landowner bears more of the burden as they argue about the fact that one landowner lives out front versus going all the way back and those kind of issues. So it, it's it's not an easy process for these owners to take on. Are these typically written and legal agreements or are they handshake agreements? How do these happen? I doubt there are any legal agreements. I mean, the homeowners association is probably as defined as it gets. And as we all know, that's sort of quasi legal. So that's probably the best as it gets. And there were, there are a few that we can actually find maintenance agreements. They're filed. Um, and, and we sometimes, if we could find them, we'll provide them to any buyers or realtors or those type of things, but it's pretty hit or miss. And I don't think it's real common. So they may have a filed agreement on an agreement on file with the register of deeds they may or may not and those are binding when they're there and often missing okay, thanks that's correct so how many of these cross access easements do we have um, that were created from 2006 to 2020 and there are 32 of them and I'm gonna show just some examples. So these are actually right next to each other. Um, so it's not uh, snapshotted. The one on the left, um, when the uh, cluster development regulations were adopted, it would only allow you to do a cluster development up to 40 acres. So if you had more than 40 acres that you wanted to develop, you had to create several different cluster developments. The problem with that was then you had like on this one, you've got, you know, five different cluster developments that were all um, approved and looked at individually instead of as a whole. And so there's no road connectivity. Uh, they, I think the planning department recognized that that really wasn't um, you know, smart planning. And so in 2012, they changed the cluster development regulations with no cap. Um, so no requirement for the maximum amount of land. So I believe this one's either 120, I think it's 120 acres on the right side. And that um, was able to be reviewed as a whole and provide some more road connectivity. 
And even in that situation on the left, there's at least one parcel smack in the middle that does not have any private road access, no public road access, and that would be a landlocked parcel. If they came to you for a building permit, they're out of luck. So the parcels that are in the middle that are labeled FDA are future development area. Those are set aside. They cannot be developed until the property annexes into the city limits or the property is rezoned. So here's some photos just of um, same neighborhoods that we just showed in that map um, on the ground. And those do have the brown signs. Those are newer private roads. Um, the new cluster developments that have come in since 2006, I believe, I think every one of those has a brown sign, the newer ones. And that looks like a county road, but that is a cross access easement back to all of those um, parcels that you saw. That was That's one of our biggest cluster developments. I believe it served 21 residential parcels. So common concerns that we um, deal with kind of on a regular basis with private roads is really, you know, every homeowner has a different expectation of what they believe their road needs to be and how it should be maintained and what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. Um, ownership changes that we already talked about. A lot of people aren't even aware that they're purchasing property on a private road with no maintenance. I don't believe that the appraiser's office um, you know, is factoring whether a, ro a road is a private road or not a private road. Um, so we get a lot of just kind of comments about they're paying the same, you know, amount of taxes that someone with a full maintenance road has. And so, you know, is there an, an even or equal distribution of those taxpayer dollars? Uh, obviously, inadequate design and construction is one of the biggest things. So um, we there are sometimes home-based businesses or conditional use permits um, sometimes even commercial property that take access from a private road and their heavy truck traffic can actually greatly impact, you know, the people that live on those roads. Um, if it's gone through, you know, a conditional use permit or something like that, it's been addressed and talked about and brought to light, but those home-based businesses are a little bit harder if they're a landscaping business or a really small scale, but they're still bringing heavy truck traffic onto it, then there's kind of just an unequal also distribution of what the impact is to that road and who's financially responsible for how much. Uh, we do have disputes often, um, like I said, gates, barricades, um, people unhappy with each other trying to block someone else out uh, there. Uh, we've had um, farmers that um, the only way to get back to their landlocked, now landlocked farm property, the only way for them to get there is to use a private road. So sometimes we get complaints about farm equipment being on those private roads, but not necessarily contributing because they don't have a residence on it to the shared maintenance. Uh, there, we do get a lot of requests on how do we make this a public road, and Chad can talk about that. Um, I, I, you know, there is a process. It's not an easy process. So I think he has to answer those questions pretty regularly. Um, so a case study of how our office has tried to get creative um, with private roads in ways um, that get people their right to a building permit. So this one has um, BOCC minutes that approve the private road for two residences. There are two residences taking access from it. Um, the key is the parcel on the west side has road frontage. It actually was vested, so it only needed to have that acreage and that amount of road frontage at the time it was created. So it was built. It is buildable. It's buildable lot today, but. Um, Douglas County had gone through and done a huge road project there and spent a lot of money on that road improvement. And um, because of line of sight, uh, the speed limit of that road and just really safety concerns, um, our requirements would have required that they put a separate entrance and stay off of the private road um, somewhere along that county route. But because um, Public Works said, you know, no, we're not, we, that's actually a, a road safety issue. Um, we just tried to find a way to get creative. So we had them share the road right away or share the entrance within the road right away. And then we required that the driveway immediately be constructed right outside of that road right away. So technically they're not traveling along the minimum maintenance or not minimum maintenance, the private road. Um, they're not using it except for within the road right away area. So here's a photo of, you can see they um, were required to veer off immediately outside of the right away onto their own driveway um, to um, prevent them from using the private road. 
And I'll, I'll just add a little bit there. So this is Route 1055. We built this improvement in 2021. We put shoulders on the road. And when we do that, we replace all of the entrances to all of the properties. In that case, there were like 30 entrances on that project. And we build those 20 feet wide. And the reason is on a higher speed road like this, you want someone to be able to pull off the road and uh, get out of the way if someone is waiting to turn out. And so we provide that double spacing. Um, and we had gone ahead and done this. And then shortly after construction, this request came in and it really worked out kind of ideal as a shared entrance. It's the, the photo here shows it during construction. So it's a little rough, but that, that entrance uh, serving two in the back and then the one in the front, which veers off immediately to the left. And what that did is if, if you could turn and, and look left of this picture, there's a hill that blocks view. And if that new uh, building right there had taken access just further to the north by say 200 feet, then it would have been a site distance issue. So in this case, it was an easy solution because of all this other work going on. Um, usually the it, there's not an easy solution, but this one had it. So we wanted to share that. And, and it's interesting, you know, that the two properties that existed for decades were driving across the front property to get to their homes. And the front property technically was not allowed to use that entrance. That's a bizarre outcome of, of the policies of the past. And I really am surprised. I was surprised when I learned all of this, you know, initially, but um, so as we go on, I think there are more examples that aren't as, in, as easy to fix. So. So we decided we wanted to do just a review of really where we are with our private roads. Um, we, so we ran through that 169 list uh, and kind of just looked at them um, to see if they had vacant parcels sitting on them that maybe could be buildable if um, we had minutes from the BOCC that said it was buildable, but a house hasn't gone up yet. Um, and so we just kind of um, looked at compliance issue, issues, zoning issues. If it we have several 27-ish that do have compliance issues. So say it was approved for three residences and it has seven on it and we don't know why. And so some of that is just going to take some more work, some more digging, some more trying to find out if a variance was applied for. Um, a lot of the really old documentation um, is still in paper form in our office and hasn't all been scanned in and organized in a way that's easy to find. So um, we're still working through some of those compliance issues. I believe that when we get through those 27 that we're not real sure about, we're actually going to need to come back to the Board of County Commissioners and run through those with you. Because if we have, say, a private road with five houses on it, but it was only approved for three and there's a fire or a flood, um, then we have an issue with them being able to rebuild. Uh, six of the private roads um, have already been approved for another building permit, but they haven't been built yet. So those will be really easy to process. They'll be able to just walk in our office with um, their you know, construction plans and site plan and be able to get a building permit on a private road. I have a question and it was one point back. Uh, you mentioned that if they are not in compliance, there are more houses than were approved and we have a fire um, and there may be a rebuild problem unless the commission can address those individually. Has the, have you heard of any issues with um, homeowners being able to get insurance when that's the case or insurance companies not really looking at, at that far in? That's a great question. I mean, to my knowledge, I don't know of any complications with being able to insure, um, but we, we, we really aren't contacted really by insurance companies ever. Um, okay, thanks. So uh, what we were also able to do with this research is as people apply for building permits, if we can actually take a private road and bring it into current standards, so say it has road access, but there's a private road there and there's no one else taking access, um, we can essentially eliminate those. Or sometimes there's two houses accessing a private road, but the entrance is right on a shared property line. And we can do the same thing that we did in that picture before where they share in the right of way and then their driveways go off on their own, on their own private property. And so we are able through going through this research, we can eliminate 45 of those private roads just through kind of people wanting to fix those problems themselves anyway, and us kind of putting our heads together and trying to find ways to eliminate those private roads. Um, some of them have converted to public. Um, road. So maybe they've gone to a township and asked the township, will you please start maintaining this road? And they agreed to do it. 
Um, and so it, it's a mixture of all those different categories. Some of them are probably being maintained by the county now because maybe someone asked or they petitioned, I have no idea, but they've essentially eliminated uh, the need for a private road, which is great news. I mean, eliminating 45 is a really big deal. Um, so um, where we are right now with that research is we have one kind of question looming um, at that we really get regular questions about. So what happens when we have a vacant parcel sitting on a private road? It appears that it meets, you know, the five acre requirement or met the standard at the time. Um, and it's just sitting there empty. Um, you know, we do have people ask us if they're buildable. Traditionally, our office has said no. And that's because we didn't know how many of them there were. So we didn't want to bring something to the commission and say, you know, Board of County Commissioners for this specific road, will you please approve another building permit? But there might be a hundred more coming down the line. Um, so what we decided to do is Sarah said, do the research. So we did, and um, there are seven. So we felt like that was a really manageable number um, to take to the commission and have a bigger discussion about whether or not we want those to be buildable for folks. So. And that is a question that will be coming to us later when we are, when we do have the ability to vote, which we do not in a work session, is that be correct? That's correct. Okay. And probably individually, you know, I don't know that, you know, I think we've got, we're going to try to take them as, as, yes. as staff has the ability to sort of bring those seven to you. Yeah, we don't have any intention of asking for all seven vacant lots to be approved tonight. Um, that, I mean, some of them really need to be looked at on a case by case yes. basis. We need to notify the landowners that might be affected. Um, and so it would have been a pretty big meeting if we would have done that just for all seven. Yeah. Thanks. So these are the roads that we've identified as um, approved private roads, but have the ability um, to maybe possibly get another building permit off of those private roads. So then uh, roads would come to us individually when there's an interest in developing that parcel, but they wouldn't necessarily come to us before that. So if nobody's looking to build there, we wouldn't go advertise that this is now at a parcel. You got parcel. it. <laughs> and, and when those uh, parcels are valued, are they valued based on buildable or not buildable parcel? Or is it just a, you pay a, the same price per acre, whether that is a buildable lot or not? And that might be a question for Sarah. Well, uh, you know, my assumption is most property is priced based off of how it's appraised. So, and it's appraised based off a of land use. So, however yeah. that land is being used, if there's no house on it, then and it's full of trees, it's probably being appraised at a wooded lot. Yeah. If it's you know grasses, then it's probably being appraised at you know a grass value. Yeah. So five acres of landlocked ground that is not buildable is appraised at the same as five acres of similar looking ground that could be buildable. They're, they pay right. the same taxes. Yeah, taxes okay. are not on potential. They're okay. on what its current use is. Okay, thanks. And the appraiser is in the room and he will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if, if I get that wrong, but so far so good, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, just looking at these, this is just a quick down and dirty of these roads um, that could have the potential ability to be buildable. Uh, this one did go through the Board of County Commissioners. It was approved for one house. Um, the one house you can see is off to the west, not highlighted. There's already a house on the 1804. Um, and then we have two residential, possible residential lots that could be buildable that the private road um, travels through. One has road access down below, um, public road access. And then the other essentially is landlocked without that private road. Here's E500 Road. This one has gotten a lot of traffic in our office. So um, there's a little bit of um, minimum maintenance also associated with this. So um, when you're heading south off a of 500 Road, um, you can see just a tiny, um, you know, non-connectivity there. That's minimum maintenance and would require a full maintenance designation before anything more could happen. But right now we have someone traveling down that and still was able to get a building permit. Um, and it was approved for one house. We have a lot of land to the north and south of that driveway um, or private road. Uh, we have approximately 35 acres to the north. I don't even remember 50 acres to the south. We have a lot of people that have asked if those could be buildable. 
um, and and um, are willing to even, you can see that there's several tracks associated with them. They're willing to combine tracks. They're willing to do all kinds of things um, if those were had the ability to, to be able to be built on. Here's uh, another one. This is actually one that you'll see later tonight in the um, public meeting. This is E773 Road. It does have public road access uh, in 2050 Road. And that um, public road access is township maintained. It um, is a vested parcel, so it is buildable. So they could come to our office, build their own entrance off of N2050 Road today and get a building permit today. Um, what uh, the property owners that have purchased this property would like to do, um, it, there's a really beautiful entrance that was built off the private road. Um, the whole northern side of that, and we can talk about this later, is covered with old growth forest um, and some sensitive lands. And so they'll be uh, requesting um, a decision from the Board of County Commissioners tonight. In 840 Road was a road that was retroactively approved. So there's no Board of County Commission minutes. There's two houses taking access from it um, and the potential for one additional. In 1602 Road, same retroactive, no county commission minutes. Two houses are taking access. Oh, and I think it would be also important if these property owners would have gone to the Board of County Commissioners and you know went through the pro the approval process. Most likely, these would have been approved for three, um, but we don't have minutes, so we're not able to honor that. So by not having minutes, meaning they did not come before the Board of County Commissioners, or they came before the Board of County Commissioners and the minutes were lost. Oh. They did not go before the Board of County Commissioners, but um, they were retroactively approved with that 1998 resolution that said, oops, we missed building permits. Um, you know, we accidentally issued building permits, um, creating essentially private roads. So we need to honor what's there. But in that resolution, it specifically said it didn't it didn't mean that you got to have more. OK. This was one that actually went to the Board of County Commissioners a couple years ago. Um, it was approved. We have minutes for one residence. And you can see um, it's got land to the north of it, land to the south of it. And um, a, a lot of the uh, issues that we encounter is this private road travels entirely through their own property. And we're telling them that they can't use it. Um, and, and only because we have minutes that say only one house gets to use it. Um, but the reality of it is pretty challenging to tell someone no. And that piece of property could have changed hands. They visually see that there is a road, a road running through it, and they probably can't fathom that that is not, does, does not mean that they can build on it. Yeah. And two or three years ago when this came up, we, um, the Board of County Commissioners actually said, so, you know, if we allowed someone to use this private road, um, how many more would we be looking at? And that's when we were kind of tasked with doing that research. Um, and that's why kind of we're back today as well, because I do anticipate this will be another that would come to you on a case-by-case -case basis um, because there's been interest in the past. E2338 Road, again, no county commission minutes from it. There's two houses. It's serving two houses currently, but it has a really odd-shaped parcel that could be another buildable lot. And that is all I have for you today. I'm afraid I have dominated much of the questions. So I would like to pitch it to Commissioner Reed to see if she has anything to ask Tanya. And then are we also going to hear from you, Chad, too? No, okay. I, I was just going to add a thought, but this is great. Well, Chad, I'm interested to hear your thought if you'd like to add it still. Um, and Commissioner Riley, you touched on a few of the questions I had, so um, I don't think I have any lingering ones at this time. So uh, one of the things I, I wanted to point out was that uh, floodplain and drainage is a big issue on private roads that we are asked about. It, and we don't we haven't seen any, like in the seven that we just reviewed, there aren't those kind of concerns, but there are some isolated spots around the county that I've addressed multiple times with people, you know, and it's, as you said, the properties have changed hands and then the same questions come back. But the idea that a private road can cross a major floodway and have a substandard bridge or a culvert 
is a very bad idea and it's happened and we've seen that and we've had to advise people and it gets to the point where they're basically having to duplicate all of the work that we as a, a, a county or a township would do on drainage design and uh, infrastructure and cost and literally a hundred thousand dollars just to be able to get your entrance to a, an acceptable standard it's not so the seven we reviewed though as i was sitting here i was making sure that we're not getting hung up by by that issue but um, i'm thinking of others that are a problem in that regard so who flags a safety issue like that if you have a private road that's serving existing residences it's their job to maintain it including the bridge or the culvert but it becomes unsafe so in the in the county we have a, a very strict schedule for main, uh, for um uh, evaluating our uh, bridges and culverts what do they do on a private road right yeah it's there, there's nobody out there watching these things and uh there's not a process for periodic inspections or permitting or oversight of any kind. The only way that we see them is when the new owner or even the old owner calls and says, hey, I need help with this. We've had owners call and say, is there a grant program to help me rebuild my bridge that just washed out? And obviously the answer is no. And it's an expensive proposition to cross a stream that's sizable. So um, you know, that's another buyer beware situation that if you're crossing a major stream and it's not a publicly maintained road that you have a serious issue. So it seems like one of the best way forwards is this GIS that you've been talking about updating the layers so that uh, folks can find out or so that the county can find out and maybe start flagging some of these for people before it washes out or before it is a significant issue. I don't know that we have the staff time set aside to do that uh, work in terms of identifying all of them and contacting all of them. So it'd probably be more of a public outreach to say the tool is here. Would that be the, the case? Yeah, so the floodplain, uh, the FEMA floodplain maps are available. They're a part of our public layer. Um, we just did, you know, some training with realtors last week and we really heavily hit the floodplain um, tool. You can turn on the 100 year floodplain, you can turn on the 500 year floodplain, you can look at the floodway um, and kind of talked about all the differences of those. Um, you know, two major flood events have happened in the last decade that were in outside of the 500 year flood and um, mortgages federally backed mortgages only regulate the 100 year floodplain so um, and our county regulations when we regulate floodplain only regulate the 100 year floodplain so um, we really work hard individually with landowners as they come to us with questions about property especially if it's vacant and it has floodplain um, that's when we're asking to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting so we can really talk about the intention and the requirements that may need to happen to cross floodplains floodways those type of things I was going to say too that the, you know, the GIS uh, layer that we're going to dedicate to private roads will be good, but it's already out there if you know what to look for. So, when you look at the property viewer now, if there's public right of way, it shows on there because the parcel lines that you see are are for taxing purposes, so they take the right of way out. If you see that your road leaves that area and goes onto the parcel, that's a private road. And you can also see that in the way that the lines are drawn, the private roads are on there and they're very light gray lines as opposed to the big solid color coded lines for public roadways. So there, there's kind of an indication there. Um, obviously best thing is to call and ask though. Well, I, I guess I wanted to, I, I don't, I know we probably have more conversation and question, but I guess I wanna be clear about some of the next steps in terms of what I think happens from here. So in addition to sort of of those seven, bringing forward requests sort of deal with those seven as needed, eventually as staff time permits, because I, I first of all, I do really want to appreciate the staff of zoning codes to do this work. It is tremendously tedious and difficult and the records are not easy to find. So thank you so much for this important work. Um, how we want to address the 27. And I think it would be nice to sort of have um, all of those violations looked at sort of in total and, and make sure that we're being consistent in our approach on that. Not saying that we have to do the exact same thing to all 27, but, you know, and then taking in Chad's feedback onto some of those things related to, um, you know, 
floodplain and access and some of those different things, I think that would be a next step that would come out of this process is that staff would sort of develop some recommendations and some ways to deal with that. We might even need to involve legal counsel for some of that. So that would be a, a possible next step out of this project in addition to dealing with these projects as as they come forward. I think um, just not to get in the weeds, but just for every property owner out there that's on a private road, there is a process to petition to make a private road a public maintained road. Um, so, you know, I would recommend that you reach out to Public Works or the township. I do think that there's been some opinions based on different townships. You know, they are receiving the same amount of tax dollars, and I don't think they want to be completely inundated by private road requests going to public road um, maintenance. And so um, there's there's a long road ahead to try to um, make something better if they're not okay with just living with the status quo right now, um, but there is a process for it. Thank you for that. And that was kind of my next question is um, who absorbs the cost and who is it right to have absorbed the cost? Um, I don't imagine that we include in our CIP people coming forward to have the uh, um, county take over maintenance of, of private roads, and I'm sure that the townships don't either. So that would be something that would be kind of an unfunded request. Um, so that comes back to like why we don't do this anymore in terms of private roads. Um, is there also, I don't imagine that the county has a role in this, but you know, neighbors living on private roads, would you encourage them to put their agreements in writing and file those so that um, as those properties change hands, first of all, that's findable and there are um, fewer conflicts kind of on down the road or some document that they could point to for the future. Would you recommend that people do that? The wonderful thing about filed documents is that they're publicly accessible and title companies are able to find them easier. Um, so um, filing a document, I think, would be a good step in the right direction. Um, private roads, because they're private, they're not publicly maintained, doesn't mean that the county is going to regulate or help if there's an issue. Um, but certainly it helps them in a civil situation um, if, if there is a, an issue. Does that require an attorney or is that something that a person can do and file with the Register of Deeds on their own or a group of, of neighbors could do? And that's a question probably outside of your wheelhouse. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think it necessarily requires an attorney. Especially if there's already one that exists. I think you could just go to the Register of Deeds and file it. Yeah, um, and that's something certainly that, you know, I, I'm sure Kent's team would be willing to sort of talk about what would be possible and what wouldn't. But I, I don't think it requires an attorney to do that necessarily. It, it, the question is, you know, how legally binding is the agreement? And then from that perspective, you you may want an attorney. There may be a decision to choose to do that, but I don't think it requires an attorney to have that filing. For anyone who wants to know, the Register of Deeds is located on the third floor of this building, the courthouse, and they're actually very good at an answering questions for the public. Um, Commissioner Reed, did you have anything you wanted to ask or add? I think we're yeah, I just to wanted to add. add um, <clears throat> You know, it's to sort of respond to both Sarah and Tanya's most recent comments. I think for those for the 27 number, it feels like it would be, you know, it, to some degree, there's a little bit of case by case. And that makes sense to me for those seven that you've identified with the 27. I feel like it would be helpful to have some sense of, you know, categories, if you will, of sort of what the <clears throat> what the primary issue is, and also sort of a as much as possible, like a, a diverse set of potential solutions to consider, you know, if that's possible, just based on the ones you've sort of already dealt with, or internal conversations about what um, considerations, you know, may go into some of those, I think that would be helpful for us in the future and sort of organizing how we think about those consistently and try and apply some um, fairness while also acknowledging that some situations are likely to be, you know, pretty unique for one reason or another. I think that's something definitely that the team could definitely do. And, and I think zoning codes has a really strong, um, you know, they've demonstrated that they've been able to look at these individual, sometimes these situations and really come up with an answer that is sort of sensitive to our desire to have 
consistency and uh, something um, that we can monitor and know what's going to have happened, but also sensitive to a property owner that through no fault of their own and, it, you know, is found themselves in this situation. And I, I, you know, we've done that in the past and I think that's how we could approach uh, possible suggestions to the commission in the future. If we have no further questions, I just want to thank you for all the work that went into this and the clarity that you're giving to uh, uh, things that went back to way before 1972 and happened on paper documents and outside of our control. And I uh, just appreciate the, the work and, and bringing that to us. And I know that there will be some ongoing conversations about how we can retroactively go back and, and make this right for, for people that maybe weren't aware of it and um, settle some property issues. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other questions? Then uh, we will be uh, recessed until our 5.30 meeting. Thank you, everyone.